David, how's it going? Sinead here, how are you? Hi, Sinead. Well, thank you. Good. Um, David, just on the fan situation first, obviously we, we've seen the progress made in the UK. They're going to have a limited number allowed in when their um, lockdown ends. How damaging is it that there still doesn't seem to be an end in sight on this? And do you think there'll be fans in there for the Six Nations? It's still hard to say at the moment whether there will be or won't be. Um, I, I think the focus... Uh, especially over the last period of time. I mean, there's been so much going on with regards to um, certainly discussing the options of how we do it. And there's been a, a joint, um, I suppose, task force with ourselves and the other major sports to be able to look at how it's done. Um, I, I think that over the last number of weeks, uh, the health department and the government have probably been preoccupied with just general business leading into the Christmas period and things will probably be reassessed come the new year as to the feasibility of getting fans back in, into stadiums. Um, and you'd like to think that there uh, could possibly be some, some pilot programs of, of getting small numbers uh, safely uh, into stadia, um, you know, at least by the, by the Six Nations. Okay, and just finally one for me, just on the contract situation. So you said there it's going to be moved to after Christmas. Um, obviously, a high-profile number of players whose contracts uh, finish at the end of the season, and indeed a lot of um, other players as well. What's the worst-case scenario here? Could, could players lose their jobs at the end of the season? Is that what they're looking at? No, I, I don't. I don't foresee that uh, at all. Um, I, I think you know the thing that we've had to do is the way any responsible business does is look look at the the feasibility of where we're going to be financially and it's a really hard thing to predict in these times with massive uncertainty and uh, we had to make sure that un we understood our financial situation before we entered into long-term commitments to the players. So understanding uh, that situation uh, and where we're going to be uh, puts us in a place to be able to make commitments that we can keep. You touched on there a couple of times with the entry of the, uh, the stronger South African teams into what would be a Pro 16. How close to a reality is that actually? Um, well, talks are, uh, are ongoing and they're at quite an advanced stage. Um, so, um, you know, there, there is uh, obviously some time constraints about making those types of decisions because, uh, you know, to, to organise a, a significant change in competition structure uh, involves a, a, a lot of things to happen. So um, there is a lot going on behind the scenes at the moment to try and uh, see the, the possibility of, of that happening uh, in the new year. And just from what you're saying about that, you, you, am I correct in assuming that you almost feel that the current structure is, is hardly fit for purpose? Well, I, I think long term we've got to look at. I mean, you've always got to look at, at, uh, at where you want to be. And I think that uh, it's served its purpose to, to this point in time. Um, but we've, we've always got to be looking at ways uh, around improving and getting better and, and challenging ourselves more. So, um, you know, if this opportunity is here now to do that, it may not always be here. So we have to take that opportunity while it exists because uh, whether we're ready now or not, uh, it's here. And I believe that it's the best thing for Irish rugby uh, going forward. So, um, you know, I, I think that uh, um, decisions just need to be made and, and, and hopefully agreement can be reached. David, hi, it's Michael Corkin here. Um, just to, to go back to the international senior men's team, I wrote something down. I think you described our um, our performance or where we finish up in the Six Nations as an average return from an Irish point of view. Um, are you concerned, or how concerned are you that our, our our lack of consistency in terms of form has continued over the course of the last couple of weeks, and and how do you see that being addressed? Yeah. Um, look. Uh I think uh, consistency would, uh, you've put it really well, our lack of consistency is the, the part that, um, you know, uh, you, you want to see consistency. And I suppose we can't have our cake and eat it at the same time as well in using 40 players and trying to uh, ensure that we get consistency. It's an unusual opportunity that we've got this November to play test matches where you feel that you've got the ability to be able to experiment and try things. 
Uh, that doesn't come around too often in test match rugby uh, because the pressure's always on you to win. And, um, you know, I, I suppose that we damned if we didn't, damned if we didn't with regards to this window of time. Um, so, you know, the chopping and changing that we've, we've done either through uh, our own choice or, or, or by injury, but it has, it has shown us a lot. We've learned a lot about different players and different combinations. And uh, I think we've got to be judged by, by what we do going forward uh, in, the, in the 2021 Six Nations. And does the last couple of weeks serve as a kind of a slight reality check for us? Maybe we're not, uh, don't, don't have the strength in that, that perhaps we thought, or maybe we're not as good as we thought we were. Um, well, I, I don't know with regards to how good people think we are. Um, you know, I, I think that w with regards to um, with regards to where we need to be, um, you've always got to keep working on on your player depth uh, and, and where that's at, and that's why we've invested so heavily over the years in our player pathway, and you can see the number of players coming through. Um, and whenever you get one or two positions, uh, it would be very, un it'd be very unusual to have everything covered four or five deep. So, you know, you've got to consistently work on this. It's something you can never take your eye off the ball. And, uh, you know, the moment we feel that we've got, uh, we we've got some positions covered, you know, we'll start to get a little bit of vulnerability in other positions and we've just got to keep working through that. You can never predict your injury predicament uh, as well. Um, you know, injuries after the COVID layoff uh, across the board in rugby and in, in all contact sports are significantly higher than where they've been previously. Um, so, look, I, I suppose that, um, you know, it's something that, that we, we keep working on. Um, as I said earlier, the provinces have, uh, have continued to utilise uh, the pathway and academy players during this point, point in time and giving those players as much opportunity as possible to play at the highest levels possible is what player development is all about. Thank you. David Neil Tracy here in Off The Ball. How are you doing? Well, thanks. Um, just to go back on the contract situation, David. Um, uh, if there was a situation where a number of high-profile players weren't able to agree deals, would there be any possibility of changing the policy on selecting players overseas? Uh, no, we've got no intention of, of doing that, Neil, at the moment. I mean, at, at the moment, uh, the position we've been in, uh, as we've been in all along, is to, if, uh, if players uh, choose not to play their rugby in Ireland, um, it's unlikely that we would select them. It's not a hard and fast rule. There is no hard and fast rule about that. We've never had one. Um, but our attitude towards it wouldn't change. We'd be selecting players who stay here and play for our provinces. David, how's it going? Um, in terms of like the you know the idea of playing South African teams and stuff, it, like the logistics behind it and the travel costs behind it. Um, is the idea of playing, you know, linking up with the English teams ever kind of, is that being considered or do you think the door is completely closed on something like that? Oh, look, all those things have been considered and looked at and uh, I think they're fairly locked into their, their competition and and, uh, and don't really have an interest in, in looking at that option. So, um, you know, this opportunity's come along. Um, obviously, with South Africa being in the same or very similar time zone, it doesn't make the travel uh, as arduous as, as what it would have been, certainly from their point of view, with regards to what Super Rugby entailed. Um, so, um, you know, I think that it's, it's, it's definitely a good opportunity for us to, uh, to look at. And I know there's going to be a lot of focus on the players and player contracts, but in terms of, like, backroom and support staff for the IRFU and even just day-to-day -day staff as well, like, is there a worry there about jobs? Like, might jobs have to be lost in the next you know, 12 to 18 months if this keeps up? Well, look, I, I think the RFU have done a, a great job, and the provinces I include in that, in being able to maintain what we have. Um, you know, everyone's shared some of the, the financial burden uh, across the board with regards to trying to, in, in taking salary uh, reductions. Um, 
but the whole point of it has been to try and maintain the infrastructure that we've built over, a lot, uh, over many years so that when rugby does resume, that we're able to get back up and running uh, as close as possible to where we left off. Uh, and that's still the intention. Um, but, uh, you know, you would hope with the positivity that's been around in, in, in previous we weeks around vaccines, etc., cetera, that, uh, that, that hopefully, um, you know, come the, come the summer months that, that things might have a degree of normality back there and, uh, and, and hopefully, um, you know, the business can withstand the financial stress to make sure that the majority of people maintain roles and responsibilities and, and the game can kick on from there. Thanks. Okay, thanks guys. We're going to shift now into the...